Okay, yeah. thank you. Keep going. Uh, um, so I'm going to talk about a topic in uh, approximate inference uh, concerned with learning Gaussian approximations to a posterior distribution um, in high dimensions and possibly with uh, large data sets. Uh, this, the things I'm going to talk about are based on uh, three papers. Uh, one with my colleague Linda Tan from NUS. Uh, one with uh, a former postdoc, Victor Ong, and Mike Smith at University of Melbourne. And another paper with Matthias Carroz and Robert Cohn um, at University of New South Wales in Sydney. Okay, um, so what do we normally do uh, when we do Bayesian computations? Well, we do integration, right? Uh, so we have some data, Y to be observed, some unknowns we want to learn about. We construct a joint model for everything in the problem. Uh, say we have a joint density on the data and the unknowns. We specify that through the prior and some sort of sampling model. And then when the data is at hand, we put the observed data Y in there, we get the likelihood. And then um, in Bayesian inference, of course, we just condition on the data that's observed. We have a conditional distribution for the unknown given the data. And that's the posterior. So this is Bayes' rule here, uh, telling us how to update prior beliefs in the form of a prior distribution to, to a posterior distribution. And then Bayesian inference, it's concerned with uh, summarizing the posterior for inferential purposes. And as I said, any kind of summarization of the posterior is, is usually going to amount to uh, some sort of integration problem where we integrate against the posterior. So the usual way of doing business is to use, say, Markov chain Monte Carlo or sequential Monte Carlo. And, um, you know, those Monte Carlo algorithms that we usually use, they're exact in principle in the sense that if you devote enough computational effort to the problem, uh, you can, in principle, get answers to any precision you desire, okay? Now, this talk's going to be about approximate inference, and approximate inference methods, they don't have that exact in principle property. And it's worth saying a bit, first of all, about why it's interesting to consider these uh, inherently approximate algorithms, okay? So why do we want to consider doing approximate inference? Well, one main reason is just scalability. If you have a strict computational budget, the exact in principle property may not be very relevant. Um, approximate inference methods are often optimization based, and those methods often scale well to uh, large data sets. Uh, they're easy to combine with sort of subsampling based methods, which um, for methods like Markov chain Monte Carlo, it's usually not straightforward to combine those methods with uh, uh, subsampling. Um, also, you know, very often when you're doing an exploratory analysis of a data set, you know, you don't know beforehand what's a suitable model, what model you really want to fit. And um, uh, so you want to fit many different models quickly and reject most of them. If you're doing that, you really don't need very precise answers. You know, an approximate inference method is going to be enough to help you understand why some models aren't suitable. And then you can devote, uh, you can perhaps do a more, uh, more careful computation for the models that pass some initial screening. Uh, perhaps another reason too why approximate inference methods are interesting is that um, they can perform just as well as um, the exact in principle methods for predictive inference. So, um, if you have an approximate inference method in a Bayesian setup that gives good point estimates but gets the, the shape of the posterior slightly wrong, uh, nevertheless, the predictive inference may be nearly identical to what you would get if you used Markov chain Monte Carlo or something else. Okay? So very often, uh, parameter uncertainty is a very small component of uh, predictive uncertainty. For, so for predictive inference, it may not really make any difference whether you use an approximate method or not. Okay. So in this talk, I'm going to consider these uh, inherently approximate methods. They're not exact in principle. And I'm going to talk in particular about one framework for approximate inference, uh, uh, variational approximation. And the idea of variational approximation is really to reformulate Bayesian computation as an optimization problem. Okay, and the idea is that we'll have some 
uh, approximating family. Um, in this talk, it's going to be uh, the family of Molyveric Gaussian uh, distributions. And so our approximating family it has some parameters that we can adjust. So in the Gaussian case, you have a mean vector and the distinct elements of a covariance matrix. And then the idea is that we'll somehow define a measure of closeness of any approximation to the true posterior. And then we'll optimize over the variational parameters in our approximating family to get the closest approximation to the true posterior that we can. Okay, and I'm going to write the variational parameters in the approximating family by uh, lambda. Okay, so here's the idea. So this is a little toy two-dimensional example. Uh, the black contour lines here are contour lines for the true posterior density. I want to approximate that posterior density. I'm using a multivariate Gaussian approximation. Um, so here's a multivariate Gaussian density, the contour lines in green. Um, so in this particular approximating family, I have uh, five parameters. There's two uh, mean parameters and three distinct elements of a covariance matrix in two dimensions. So I have five parameters in my multivariate normal approximation, and I want to optimize those to get as close as I can to that. So I have some iterative algorithm. I start with some guess for my uh, best Gaussian approximation, and then I have some numerical optimization algorithm. It's performed iteratively, and then I get the best approximation I can in some sense to the true posterior. Okay, so... Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about variational approximation with, with Gaussians, as I said. Uh, so I'm going to write my uh, variational uh, posterior density as Q lambda theta. So that's going to be a normal mean mu covariance sigma here. So we want to optimize mu and sigma to get the best approximation. And um, so I said, you know, you need some measure of closeness of an approximation to the truth to optimize. So what measure of closeness will we use? Or we'll use the callback Leibler divergence. Um, so the callback Leibler divergence between the approximation and the truth, it can be written in this, in this way. That's uh, easy to show. So it's the log uh, marginal likelihood value at the observed data minus uh, this integral term. This integral term here, I'm going to write that as L of lambda. That's called the variational lower bound. And uh, it's called a variational lower bound because this thing, it, it lower bounds the log marginal likelihood there. Okay. Um, now, you can see that if you... This, this log marginal likelihood here, it doesn't depend on the variational parameters lambda. So if I want to minimise that callback Leibler divergence here, it, it's equivalent, actually, to maximising this, this lower bound on the, on the right. Okay. Um, Right. And of course, if, if, you, if the true posterior was within your variational family, in fact, uh, this callback Leibler divergence would be zero, and then the uh, variational lower bound would equal the, the log marginal likelihood value. Okay. So we want to minimize the callback Leibler divergence over our approximating family to get the best approximation we can to the true posterior. Um, now, how do we optimize this uh, variational lower bound? Um, that, that's challenging for a number of reasons. Um, so one reason is that, of course, this um, lower bound, it's in the form of an integration over the parameter space. Okay? Now, I said, you know, most Bayesian computation problems are integration problems, and I promised that I would reformulate these difficult integration problems in terms of optimization. Well, I've done that, but it looks like I've got an optimization of an intractable integral rather than merely an intractable integral. But um, it's possible to devise efficient optimization uh, algorithms for uh, these kinds of objectives, and I'll talk more about that later. But the other problem is that um, you know, even with a Gaussian approximation, I mean, that's a simple approximation, right? Um, you know, you might think that, you know, when Markov chain Monte Carlo came along 20 years or so ago, people stopped using Gaussian approximations, right? You think it's very crude. Um, but even a Gaussian approximation is, is challenging to, um, to use. 
in, in high dimensions. Because if the dimension of the model parameter theta is large, if you don't make any restrictions on the parameters in this variational family, of course there's um, d times d plus 1 over 2 um, distinct elements in sigma and d further elements in mu. So the number of variational parameters, it grows quadratically with the dimension d of the parameter. So um, really, even though you know, a Gaussian approximation is somehow simple, you've only got one parameter per pairwise dependence, um, even that's sort of intractable in high dimensions. So you need to somehow parameterize your variational family in a clever way. Okay, and I'll talk a bit in this talk about a few ways to do that. Uh, one way to uh, reduce the number of variational parameters you have to optimize over is to exploit conditional independence structure in the true posterior, um, which motivates uh, introducing some sparsity in the precision matrix. Um, and another approach I'll talk about is concerned with factor models, where you model the dependence through some sort of low dimensional latent variable. And it's fruitful too to combine these two sorts of ideas, and I'll talk about that as well in a spatiotemporal model example uh, towards the end. Now, I promised you could, you know, devise efficient um, optimization methods for this variation lower bound. Um, and the, the way people approach this uh, usually these days is using stochastic gradient descent methods, okay? Um, so probably most of you know what this is already. But uh, suppose, you know, I want to optimize my variation lower bound. Um, Suppose this is the gradient, and suppose I can get some unbiased estimate of the gradient at any value for lambda. Then in stochastic gradient descent, we just initialize the variational parameter somehow, and then iteratively we just follow these noisy unbiased gradient estimates according to some uh, step size uh, sequence. Okay, and the step sizes, uh, they should satisfy some conditions um, you know, you, you can choose these step sizes adaptively in various ways. Uh, very often also you need to make these step sizes uh, component specific as well. Now, um, in stochastic gradient uh, ascent, uh, it's very important that you can get low variance estimates of the gradients. So, you know, we needed unbiased estimates of the gradient and uh, controlling the variance of those estimates, it's crucial um, for stability and getting fast convergence. And um, for Gaussian approximations at least, Gaussian variational approximations, the standard way that people get uh, good gradient estimates is using something called the reparameterization trick. Uh, so let me explain what that is. Um, so let me write H for the prior times likelihood the lower bound, I can write it like this. It's the expectation with respect to Q of log H minus log Q. Um, now, if I differentiate under the integral sign here, assuming I can do that, and you do a bit of algebra, you get an expression for the gradient that is an expectation with respect to Q. But differentiating this expression here directly, um, that does not result in really usable gradient estimates, especially in high dimensions. Um, so this is where this reparameterization trick comes in. Um, so one, one problem with a naive gradient estimate where we just differentiate this formula is that of course the, uh, the variational parameters don't appear in this H here. So you don't inf use information uh, from the gradient of the posterior itself. Okay. And the reparameterization trick is just a very simple way um, that you can use uh, gradient information from the, from the posterior itself in getting your um, unbiased gradient estimates of the lower bound. And what you do in the reparameterization trick is you, uh, you require the following uh, property. Um, you require that when you have a sample theta from your variational density, you require that you can write it as a function of z and lambda, where lambda, of course, is the variational parameters, and z is a random vector 
whose density does not depend on the variational parameters. So all the randomness that goes into generating this theta uh, comes from a draw from some distribution whose uh, distribution does not depend on lambda. Okay? So we can write theta like this. And um, so this density f, which is the density of z here, it's not depending on lambda. Then we can rewrite this expectation with respect to q as an expectation with respect to f, the density of z. And writing uh, t of z lambda for theta, we've got, we've got this. Now here, if I differentiate under the integral sign, again, assuming I can do that, um, you can see that I'm going to get an expression for the gradient that's an expectation with respect to f again. So, um, and if I can easily simulate from, from f, then, um, well, if the gradient has this expression as an expectation with respect to f, I could get an unbiased estimate of the gradient by most simply even just simulating a single draw from f and then evaluating uh, this term, the, the, the derivative with respect to lambda of that term there, yeah. Okay. Um, and notice that, you know, we, we've moved the variational parameters lambda inside the h there. So when we differentiate, we're using information from the gradient of the posterior. And sort of intuitively, uh, heuristically, this is why this reparameterization trick works so well and, and, and why you get much lower gradient, uh, lower variance gradient estimates uh, using this approach compared to, to that one. Uh, there's many uh, further sort of refinements and extensions of this basic idea, but that's what I need. Okay, so, okay, so um, can we implement this reparameterization trick for a uh, normal family. So I suppose, naively, I just consider a normal approximation for Q lambda theta uh, with an unrestricted covariance matrix. So my covariance matrix sigma, I'm going to write it as uh, C times its transpose, where C is the lower triangular Cholesky factor. Uh, now, of course, if I had a draw from this uh, uh, density, I can write that as uh, mu plus c times z, where z is a, a draw from a standard normal. Okay? So this is exactly what the reparameterization trick requires, that you can write a draw from a variational distribution as a function of a random vector that has a distribution not depending on the variational parameters and the variational parameters. Okay? So the Gaussian family, it has the structure you need for the reparameterization trick to work. Um, so, um, <clears throat> the, the sort of low variance gradient estimates you can get by reparameterization, they're available here for uh, Gaussian variational approximations. Um, but, you know, Gaussian variational approximation, it's still hard <coughs> um, if you parameterize sigma with a dense Cholesky factor because you've just got too many parameters to optimize over, and that makes it very challenging. So. The uh, number of parameters in sigma, if you don't restrict them, you know, it, it grows quadratically with the dimension of the model parameter. And so, as I said, we need to come up with clever parameterizations where we restrict, you know, the, the dependent structure in a, in a way that suits the problem somehow. Okay, so how do we come up with sensible um, parameterizations of the, of the covariance matrix in a... In a, in a Gaussian variational approximation. Well, what kind of exploitable structure is available in a typical problem? Well, uh, one thing you might have is uh, a knowledge of conditional independence structure, okay? And so you might say, well, okay, um, I, if I have a certain conditional independence structure in the true posterior, is there a way that I could match that with um, the conditional independence structure in my Gaussian approximation? And, of course, the answer is yes, you can do that. Um, so, as you probably know from elementary uh, multivariate analysis, if you have a Gaussian random vector with a covariance matrix sigma, if you look at the precision matrix, the inverse of the covariance matrix, then if the ijth entry is zero, that means that variables i and j are conditionally independent given the rest. Um, so, if you had some conditionally independent structure in the true posterior, if you wanted to match that conditional independence structure 
in a Gaussian approximation, what you would do is you would make the precision matrix sparse. Okay? And so, um, and that's going to reduce the number of parameters you need to optimize over in an approximation. Okay? Uh, so let me just talk about a, a simple case first, a motivating example. So this example is a, a longitudinal generalized linear mixed model. Uh, so I suppose I've got observations Y. YI is the observation for the ith subject. There's NI, uh, say, repeated measurements on subject I. I've got uh, subject-specific random effects B. So BI is the random effect for subject I. And the BI are assumed normal zero G, say, where G is a covariance matrix that I don't know. And then, um, so this is the likelihood, say, so we've got conditional independence of the, of the observations given the global parameters eta and the random effects bi. Okay, so eta is denoting all the fixed parameters in the model, the, the g and um, other fixed parameters in the regression mean model and so on. Um, so if I look at the joint posterior here for theta, the unknowns that consist of the random effects and the global parameters, the, the posterior is proportional to the prior on eta times this uh, likelihood times the, this is the conditional prior for the, the random effects. And, you know, if you look at that joint posterior distribution for theta, what you'll notice is that the random effects for two different clusters, they're conditionally independent given the global parameters eta. So I have this conditional independence property. Um, now, if I wanted to construct a, a Gaussian approximation to the posterior here, which reflected that conditional independence structure I have in the true posterior, this is the sort of thing I'd do, okay? So this is my precision matrix omega. Omega is the inverse of sigma. Suppose I've ordered the components of theta like this, B1 to Bn, then eta. Um, suppose I have this block, block sparse structure in omega, okay? Um, then, you know, using that property that I, I uh, mentioned in the last slide, um, if you had this sort of block sparse structure in omega, that would imply that, um, you know, you have conditional independence in your Gaussian approximation between the ith and the jth random effects given eta, okay? And you see, I've reduced the number of parameters. If I'm using this omega as, say, the parameterization somehow in a Gaussian approximation, I've reduced the number of parameters I need to optimize over drastically. Okay. Um, now, it's because of the positive definiteness constraint, it's, it's easier to work with the Cholesky factor. So um, I'm going to look at approximations where I... Um, parameterize in terms of the Cholesky factor T of the precision matrix. Um, so if you, uh, well, so, so that guarantee, basically that guarantees positive definiteness if you parameterize in terms of T, that's easier to work with. Um, and you, you can see that if you impose a suitable sparse structure on the Cholesky factor T, that will also give you the sparse structure you want in omega. Um, so um, suppose I impose this kind of block sparse structure on the Cholesky factor T. It's not hard to see that if you look at this T times its transpose, you get an omega that has that form. Now, um, I should say something here. Um, There's, there's a little lemma that's almost trivial to prove, which says that, you know, if, if you have a, a Cholesky factor like this and you look at that factor times its transpose, you know, the, the leftmost non-zero entry in each row will match between the Cholesky factor and the, and the precision matrix, okay? So that, that doesn't mean that the sparse structure within blocks is the same, okay? But in, in this particular ordering of imposed on the random effects and eta, um, you know, if, if, I, if, I, if I have the same block sparse structure 
between the lower triangle of T and, and the lower triangle of omega, um, you know, I, I get the, the right kind of conditional independent structure in my approximation. Okay, okay so um, I just looked at a particular example there, the example of a, a longitudinal generalized linear mixed model. Uh, but what about a slightly more general framework? Um, so suppose now I've got observations Y uh, as before. I've got uh, observation specific latent variables. So before they were random effects, but these could be, say, um, states in state space model or something like that. And I've got some global parameters eta that aren't varying by observation. Um, suppose my joint model uh, has this form. Okay, so I've got a prior in the global parameters. I've got this likelihood term. And then for my conditional prior on the observation specific parameters given the global parameters, I've got some kind of uh, Markovian model, I suppose. And so in this uh, joint model, you have conditional, independent, conditional independence of, of BI from the other Bs given K nearest neighbors in the ordering, okay? And, and, and given eta, the global premise. So my previous random effects example, that fits the story with K equals zero. If I had a state space model for a time series, that would fit the story with uh, K equals one. And for a state space model, <coughs> um, to, to, if I was doing a Gaussian variational approximation, um, and I wanted the conditional independent structure in the true posterior here in my approximation, what sort of, uh, you know, block sparse structure would I choose for omega? Well, I need something like this. I've got a sort of block tridiagonal structure uh, for the, the B part of the precision matrix. And, uh, you know, I have this kind of structure, then, then I have, you know, conditional independence between states giving, given the neighboring states and the global parameters. Okay, and again, I can sort of match the block sparsity of a Cholesky factor to the block sparsity of omega, and that will give me um, a convenient parameterization and one where um, I'm getting the conditional independent structure that I want. Okay, um, so now I'm going to look at Gaussian variational approximation where my variational parameters lambda consist of mu and t. t is the Cholesky factor of the precision matrix. And I'm going to assume that t is sparse, okay? So I have a many fewer parameters now to optimize over. Okay, so now this is, this is sigma, the covariance matrix. Um, can I apply the reparameterization idea for doing gradient estimation? Yes, I can. So if I have a draw theta from this density, I can write it in a generative form like this, okay? And it's very easy to, to compute this because um, to compute this term here, you just need to solve a sparse triangular linear system, and that's, that's easy. Um, and, you know, if you look at the sort of expressions for the gradient of the lower bound that you get, um, when you apply the reparameterization trick, you have these expressions. So again, I've expressed these gradients as expectations with respect to F. F is the density of a bunch of standard normals. And um, if I want to get an unbiased estimate of the gradient of the lower bound with respect to the variational parameters, I can just draw a single draw for Z and evaluate the, the terms inside the brackets there. And that's, that's an unbiased estimate of the gradient. I can take more than one sample if I want, of course, and, and average, but generally we just use one, one sample. And the nice thing about this, uh, these gradient expressions is you can see if I want to compute these gradients, that can be done efficiently, computationally. You just need to be able to do things like um, solve sparse triangular linear systems. Okay, so in high dimensions, uh, this parameterization, it's... Uh, it's sort of expressive if you have conditional independent structure. You can match the, the T to the, the conditional independent structure you have. 
um, but it's tractable because you know, most of the elements of T are, are zero and, and the computations are, are feasible for high dimensions. You just need to be able to solve sparse triangular linear systems. That's, that's nice. Uh, let me show you one example and then I'll talk about some other ways to do things. Um, so this is going to be uh, uh, an example just on a logistic regression with random effects. In fact, a, a random intercept model. Um, so this isn't really a very big data set, but it's a data set where I can do a lot of different methods and compare things. Okay, so I've got data on 500 subjects over seven years. Um, I've got a binary response that's measured repeatedly for different subjects. The binary response at any time, it's whether or not the subject's taking drugs from three or more different groups. You've got some covariates like gender, race, age, number of outpatient mental health visits. As I said, it's a random intercept model. Um, and in this model, I've got eight fixed effects parameters in, in the mean, one variance parameter, and 500 random intercepts for the 500 subjects. And I'm going to compare our approach here based on a sparse Cholesky factor for the precision matrix with um, some other common implementations of Gaussian approximation. Um, I'm going to compare with this automatic differentiation variational inference method, or ADVI. That's, that's implemented in the statistical package STAN. Um, I'm going to compare that with uh, something called doubly stochastic variational inference. Actually, the, the STAN method is essentially this, this doubly stochastic variational inference method, but the difference lies in um, the uh, default uh, step size choices and stopping rule in STAN are uh, not working particularly well, at least in this example. And so we, we implemented the doubly stochastic variational inference in a, in a different way with different um, step size choices and stopping rules. And, um, okay, so for the doubly stochastic variational inference and automatic differentiation variational inference, actually we've implemented them in two ways. One is in a mean field version where you assume the covariance matrix is diagonal so you don't capture any dependence uh, another um, implementation uses the full dense Cholesky factor of the covariance matrix. Okay. Um, so here's uh, a comparison of the marginal posterior distributions estimated by different methods on that example. So um, blue is showing the mean field methods. So these are the methods that are just... Um, assuming the covariance matrix is diagonal. So if you do that, you can't capture any posterior dependence. And you can see that the, the blue lines uh, for the diagonal approximations, um, they don't fit very well with the, the true posterior, which is in black. Okay. So you substantially underestimate uncertainty if you ignore all the dependence structure in the posterior. Uh, green lines are showing you what happens with a dense Cholesky factor for the parameterization. And um, you can see here that uh, we're getting some very poor approximations. Th this is really an optimization issue, not a... Because uh, you, know, you might think, okay, well, if you, if you make the variational family richer, um, you can't do worse, right? And I guess that's true, but... Um, if you try and automate in a, in a very high dimensional problem, when you have lots of variational parameters to optimize over, um, doing things like automating uh, step size choices and, and choosing sensible stopping rules and so on is, is difficult and convergence can be, can be slower. Okay. So um, for the green lines here, for the ADVI, we just use the stand default stopping rule and step size choices. And it, it didn't work very well so we, we tried doing our own implementation and uh, that works a little bit better but it's still challenging to get this to work well in a high dimensional problem um, if you use a, a, a dense uh, Cholesky factorization for the parameterization of the family. <coughs>
uh, okay, so in this case, the, so the, the, the red is our own method, the, the sparse precision Cholesky approach. And so we can get, you know, pretty close to the true posterior in black uh, using this uh, uh, particular approach. Now, of course, if, if the dimension of the model parameter was really high, um, you know, it, it would be very hard to implement some of these alternative uh, approaches. Um, the sparse precision Cholesky approach, it's also uh, competitive computationally. Um, so here are some of the run times for the different methods. These different methods, they were implemented using different uh, software, but a referee asked us to, to do it, so we did it. So I thought I'd tell you. Um, so for the automatic differentiation variational inference, if you use mean field, that's a diagonal uh, covariance. The runtime was seven seconds, 75 seconds for a dense Cholesky. Um, for the DSVI, uh, 30 seconds for the mean field, 262 seconds for the dense Cholesky. Um, for the sparse precision Cholesky, 56 seconds. So the DSVI and the eta delta methods, uh, the DSVI and the sparse Cholesky methods, um, the implementation was in Julia um, and the ADVI that's uh, implemented in Stan. Okay, um, so exploiting conditional independent structure was one idea for making Gaussian approximations tractable. Um, in high dimensions. Um, but there are other possibilities too, and I want to talk about another possibility. So this uh, other possibility would be to use a, a sort of low rank plus diagonal structure, okay? So, you know, sometimes um, you want to approximate a high dimensional posterior distribution and, and, and there's no conditional independent structure to exploit. So, uh, for example, in some regression problems, perhaps the dependent structure is really coming from the structure of the explanatory variables in the regression. Um, so we need alternatives. Uh, so one alternative is, is this, as I said, this uh, low rank plus diagonal kind of uh, approximation. So here in the, in the covariance matrix, we've got a sort of a tall skinny matrix B so D is the dimension of theta, and uh, so B is a matrix with, with D rows and P columns, where P is much smaller than D. And uh, D is um, a diagonal matrix here with diagonal elements uh, delta, okay? And if you, if you fix this P as D grows, then the number of parameters in this is just growing linearly with, with D. And... Um, so this kind of covariance structure, it corresponds to what people would call a factor model. Uh, so, uh, and um, you can write draws from this uh, distribution in a nice generative form that is really what you need for implementing the, the reparameterization gradients, okay? So if I have a random draw from this thing, I can write that as mu plus bz plus d epsilon where Z and Epsilon are both vectors of standard normals, okay? Okay, so in that generative model, um, you know, this is just like a, what people call a factor model. So the term BZ, um, this is sort of explaining all the dependent structure through some low dimensional latent variable. So Z is just, is P dimensional. So you have some low dimensional latent variable that explains all the shared variation, the dependence uh, the D is diagonal, so this D epsilon, that's giving you variation that's component specific, that's idiosyncratic uh, variation. And factor models are a well-known way to give parsimonious descriptions of high dimensional dependence structure. And for identifiability, we set the upper triangle of B to zero. Um, so here, if we parameterize the covariance matrix in this way, we have variational parameters mu and b and delta, and the dimension of that variational parameter is growing linearly with, with, uh, with d. Um, 
So as I said, we can use this generative representation um, of the factor model for implementing reparameterization gradients. And so you have these expressions for the, uh, for, for, for the, gra the gradient with respect to the blocks of the variation parameters. Um, again, I've got here an expectation with respect to uh, just a vector of the d density of a vector of standard normals. Um, so if I want an unbiased estimate of the gradients, I can just draw a single sample, say, from, from F. Uh, F is the density of Z and epsilon here. And then I evaluate these expressions um, for that, say, single draw of Z and epsilon. And the computations might seem difficult if the theta is high dimensional for those gradients. But, um, you know, b because this is, has a... Because the covariance matrix has a low rank plus diagonal structure, you can use the, the Sherman-Morrison-Woodbury formula to ease the computations. And so the, the computations are all uh, tractable for estimation of the gradient. Yeah. Okay, so I thought it'd be interesting just to compare um, the, the sort of factor approach with um, the approach I described uh, a minute ago based on conditional independence. So this is the same model as before this random intercept model for uh, some binary longitudinal data. Um, so <clears throat> here I've got some um, estimated bivariate marginals for pairs of fixed effects parameters in the model. Um, and I'm showing you for the different columns estimates based on the factor approach with 0, 4, and 20 factors. So with 0 factors, you just have a diagonal approximation, and that's uh, pretty terrible. Uh, but the point of this uh, slide is really to show you that, at least in this example, even if you only have a very small number of factors, say 4 factors, you seem to be able to successfully capture most of the dependence. Um, so there's not much difference here between the the, es the uh, estimated posterior distributions with, with four factors and, say, 20 factors. So, uh, you know, in our experience, um, using a factor structure for the covariance matrix, it can be very successful uh, even with just a small number of factors. Yeah. Um, so here's comparing the posterior marginals uh, for our the factor method with different numbers of factors with the uh, approximation by uh, Tan and Knot. So that's the, the sparse uh, 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 Cholesky precision uh, parameterization. And um, so you can see again with, uh, in estimating these posterior marginals for these uh, eight fixed effects parameters and this uh, random intercept variance parameter, um, you know, the, the, I showed you before the, the Tan and Knot approach, it's, it's pretty close to the exact answer that you get by MCMC. Um, with, with zero factors, that's just the diagonal approximation where we're underestimating uncertainty a lot if you look at the, the results. But even with four factors, um, we're getting pretty, pretty good, good agreement. And... Uh, going from four to 20 factors uh, doesn't really help that much. Uh, you might wonder how, how well are the random effects being estimated. So here's just a plot of the um, posterior means um, and standard deviations for the variational factor approach versus the Tan and Knot approach. So as I said, the, the Tan and Knot approach, basically it, uh, it, it gives you answers that are, are in very good agreement with the uh, an MCMC gold standard. So you can see that the random effects uh, seem to be very well estimated in terms of the posterior mean and standard deviation. And these results are based on um, a, a factor structure with, with just four factors again. Okay, um, so those are sort of two approaches to uh, parameterizing a, a covariance matrix in Gaussian variational approximation.
Um, it's also fruitful to combine conditional independent structure with factor structure. And um, as the talk goes on, I'm going to become increasingly vague. And, uh, I'm going to skip some details here, but um, but one one uh, application where we've uh, successfully used a combination of conditional independent structure with factor type structure is in in high dimensional state space models. So I'm going to talk about that now. So I suppose I've got a time series uh, observations y1 to yn. Uh, there's a state space structure with with these states, and these states are high dimensional. So. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to use a Gaussian variation approximation. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to model the posterior dependence among the states through basically a dynamic factor model. Okay. So the idea is that you'll use the factor idea to give you some dimension reduction for the states. And then for the low dimensional factors, you'll assume some sort of conditional independence uh, in time that gives a sparse precision matrix for the the factors, okay? So you can sort of combine here the idea of a factor structure for dimension reduction with uh, conditional independent structure to give you a, a, a nice parameterization of the low dimensional factors uh, dependence. Okay, so we've implemented this sort of approach in a, in a spatiotemporal model. This is a model that was described in this paper by Weichel and Hooten. It's uh, concerned with the data set on the spread of uh, an invasive species, the Eurasian collared dove, across North America. And they had data um, relating to 111 different spatial regions. So I've got 111 different spatial grid points in the model, and you have dove counts within those areas. And the data consists of uh, spatial counts. Uh, over time, and in their model, they have the, the vectors of spatial counts. Their model is conditionally independent Poisson, um, and then the, the the log means they're modeled as a sum of a spatial intensity process and a sort of measurement error process. And the spatial intensity process that involves, according to some sort of dynamic Markov model, and they get their dynamic Markov model. Uh, through discretizing some kind of diffusion equation. So it's a fairly complicated model, I won't say more than that. So in their model, they have uh, 4,233 or 223 unknowns. Um, and we're going to consider uh, an approximation with, with f only four factors for um, doing the dimension reduction for the states. And um, in our reduced parameterization, there's uh, 6,500 variational parameters, roughly. If you didn't restrict the covariance matrix and you tried to do a Gaussian approximation with this many unknowns, you'd have about 9 million variational parameters. And that's, that's really intractable. So, you know, by considering this um, factor plus uh, conditional independence kind of parameterization of the dependent structure, you reduce the number of variational parameters in, in your approximating family massively. Um, so here's some results comparing. In this example, this, for this model, you can sort of do MCMC. You, you can. Um, Weichel and Hooten did that in their original model. Uh, they used a... Uh, a Gibbs sampler where they just updated the states one at a time. Okay. Now, but such algorithms, of course, have problems with uh, slow mixing. Of course, you could consider using some more uh, sophisticated uh, method like uh, a pseudo-marginal method or particle MCMC or something like that. But, but such uh, methods are really hard to implement in when the state's high dimensional. Okay. So here we've got. Um, Comparing the results of our variational approximation to MCMC, um, so variational approximations on the left here, the MCMC is on the right. We've plotted the estimated spatial intensity process at different times, estimated by variational approximation in MCMC. And the estimates are pretty much uh, 
identical. Okay. Uh, here's another uh, plot comparing the MCMC results to the variational Bayes ones. Um, here we looked at the uh, spatial intensity process. We average spatially and plot the average uh, intensity over time. And again, if you look at the um, draws from the MCMC posterior and the VB posterior, you get uh, very, very similar results. Um, here's an example um, of some results for some of the fixed parameters. So in this spatiotemporal model, there's, there are these sort of diffusion parameters associated with each spatial site. So there's, there's 111 of these things. Um, so these are the marginal posteriors for some of these um, diffusion parameters for six different locations. So these ones on the left, this is for locations where there are zero counts for the whole time period. Uh, in the middle here, these are posterior distributions for locations where there's um, uh, a low number of counts in total. And on the right here, there's um, marginal posteriors for, for diffusion coefficients at, at locations where the number of counts is high. And when you have low counts, um, the true posterior is, is actually highly skewed. And of course, a Gaussian approximation doesn't really uh, capture that. Uh, now, of course, you could fiddle around with different uh, transformations in the parameterization to make a Gaussian approximation more reasonable. But, um, you know, I think this example shows to some extent that um, even if you only capture the posterior roughly with these variational me methods, if the point estimates are good, the predictive inference is not going to be very different between the approximate method and the MCMC method. Uh, so let me just conclude by talking about a bit of uh, future work. Um, I've been looking uh, recently at uh, uh, approximations based on Gaussian copulas and skew normal copulas. So in these sort of families of approximations, there's some sort of underlying Gaussian structure. You can use all the stuff I've been talking about and the reparameterization gradient methods but you can get non-Gaussian approximations, okay? And so, for example, in that last example where I couldn't capture the skewness in the, in the, in the true posterior, uh, these methods can help with this sort of thing. Um, so, you know, you, you might have been wondering, why did I devote such attention to looking at Gaussian approximations? You know, isn't that very crude? But really, um, these Gaussian variational approximations, they're a fundamental building block for more complicated procedures. If you want to use a, a Gaussian mixture approximation that's more flexible or, or some sort of copular approximation, um, you know, these, these, these Gaussian approximations are, are, are relevant to, to being able to do these more complicated things. Uh, another thing we're working on at the moment is, uh, or at least I'm not, but Matthias Carroz, one of my collaborators, is working on is he's uh, trying to write an R package uh, uh, with uh, using automatic differentiation methods to uh, automate the model specific parts of the, the implementation so that it's easy to do this stuff for new models. Another thing I'd like to experiment with is uh, what are called amortized variational inference methods that are common in the machine learning uh, community. So there they sort of parameterize um, variational uh, parameters for local latent variables as functions of local data so that the number of variational parameters doesn't grow with an increasing sample size. Okay, and here's some references. Um, um, so the, the three papers I talked about there were uh, this one for, by Linda Tan and myself. This is on the sparse precision matrices. Uh, this paper on the, the factor models and this is the, the paper on the high dimensional state space modeling where we use the combination of conditional independence and, and factor structure. Okay. So thanks very much for listening and uh, any questions? Right. Uh, conditional data and other things. Oh, yes. Yeah.
Okay, so um, sure. So, for example, in my in a lot of models, there are you, you might have parameters that are observation specific and, and parameters that are shared. So, for example, in my random effects example, um, it's basically a logistic regression with a random effect. And in a logistic regression with a random effect, y y you model, say, the, the log odds of a response being one as um, linearly in some covariates, and you've got some, some covariates with fixed coefficients, but then you've got, for some subset of the covariates, you might have some the coefficients vary by subject. So in my, my example, I just had a random intercept model. So the intercept is, is individual specific, but the covariate effects are fixed. So the, the, the covariate effects that are fixed, they have parameters that are fixed. They would be go in the eta, but the random intercepts, they vary by subject. They go into the latent variables. Okay. And again, in the logistic uh, regression with random effects example, I also have a variance parameter. I have the, the variance of the random intercepts. Okay, so, so the, basically the, if you have a model with observation specific parameters, you're collecting them all together, that gives you the B and, and the rest is, is the eta, the, the global parameters. Yeah.